Hello, and welcome to Scientific Terminology. We're back today to talk about proteins, which are incredibly important biological molecules that do a so many things for living cells. So we're going to take a moment to learn about what proteins are, um, how we figured out what they were, and then how exactly they're made in living cells. So let's get started by just talking about what a protein is. Proteins are the building blocks that create living organisms. They perform tasks for cells and the body, like metabolizing energy or constructing new structures. Proteins are built from amino acids that are lined up based on the blueprint in our DNA. So when people say that DNA is kind of like the blueprint of our body, it is because all of the proteins, all the different parts that make us up are coded for in the DNA. And we'll explain kind of how that works in a little bit. So you'll see exactly how that, that works in practice. What do proteins do specifically? Uh, they do a multitude of things for cells in our body, um, but there are kind of major types of proteins that do certain tasks. There's many different ones in these different groups, but it's nice to kind of have a general overarching archetype, right? So the first thing being antibodies, which are part of the immune system response to contagions. There are contractile proteins, which mediate the contractions of fibers and cells and like the heart and muscles and stuff like that. There are enzymes, which speed up chemical reactions with living cells, either by bringing the two things together that need to, ha need to be combined so they can be combined easier, or maybe making it easier to split something apart right? They speed up that reaction. That would take so much longer without them. Hormonal enzymes perform numerous functions like processing sugar or regulating the thyroid. Structural proteins help create and maintain higher order structures in the body. Storage proteins accumulate and store energy for later use. And then transport proteins move substances through biological membranes that otherwise would be impassable. So without these transport proteins, we wouldn't be able to move, for instance, like sugar through our cells from our blood, which is pretty important. Let's talk about one protein in particular real quick, just to kind of give you an example. Hemoglobin is a protein, um, and it's found in blood, and it helps the transportation of oxygen throughout the body. As you can see over here in this structure, it's this really big carbon circle with some nitrogens in the center. And those nitrogens hold an iron atom there in the, in the center of the protein. You can kind of see it in the hole over here too. This is where the iron atom would go. And that iron atom holds on to oxygen molecules, um, which allows it to be transported through the blood. So um, that iron, like I said, is in the middle of the protein and it holds oxygen and it can also hold carbon dioxide. Now, the reason that this is actually an interesting fact we'll add in here, the reason that carbon monoxide is so poisonous is because carbon monoxide also bonds to this iron and it will not unbond. So that's why if you breathe in too much carbon monoxide, you can die. It's because it's basically taking your hemoglobin out of, out of, uh, out of commission. They can't function because that iron is taken up by carbon monoxide that will not unbond with it. This is also the reason why iron intake is so important for our bodies. It's because we need it for hemoglobin, amongst other things. There's other things we use iron for in our bodies, but one of the major things is this hemoglobin that transports oxygen throughout the body. Let's shift to talk about who discovered proteins. They were first described by the Dutch chemist Gerardus Johan Mulder, and they were named by the Swedish chemist Jans Jakob Berzelius in 1838. So we've known about proteins for a while. We've kind of figured out what they were um, in the mid 19th century. Mulder determined that these proteins all had roughly the same empirical formula of C400, H620, N100, O120, P1, S1, which led him to believe that proteins may be composed of a single large type of molecule, which isn't right but it is kind of on the right track. So he kind of figured out that these things are made of building blocks. He just didn't realize that they were different kinds. Uh, Mulder would go on to discover that proteins are made from amino acids, although he didn't quite put that together. He broke them apart and he 
got an amino acid as a product of that uh, breakdown of a, of a protein. So he was almost there, um, but not quite. We figured it out since then. So let's talk a little bit about the protein creation process and how that all works. First of the thing you need to know is that their proteins are made of amino acids. There are 20 essential amino acids that make up all the proteins in humans. And amino acids have similar bases, but differ by what are called side chains. So over here, you can see in this chart, all the different side chains of amino acids. If you see here, we've got the OH, double bonded O, NH2 is present in all of them in some shape or form, right? They're all there. And then whatever's on this extra bit is called the side chain. It's this extra stuff that makes it a different amino acid. Um, and they all have different things that they are able to do. So um, each amino acid has been assigned a three-letter code that stands in for when we discuss proteins. So instead of writing out asparagine a billion times, right, we can write it as ASN. Or um, they've even gone farther and they've given each one a one-letter thing so that when you're, you can make like really simple drawings of proteins um, with just the letters. So you could do like R, H, N, C, F, and that could be a protein. And we could all say, okay, that's arginine, histidine, asparagine, glycine, phenylalanine, phen phenylalanine, names. So these amino acids are very important when you're talking about biochemistry um, and biology when you're talking about these proteins. Proteins are assembled right, using a complex biological mechanism that requires many proteins that help read the DNA and then assemble the various amino acids in order. And we could go into much greater detail on how all that works. We could go into the individual proteins and each step, step, like step by step, but we're gonna stay more general. Uh, DNA is read in the nucleus of the cells and then it gets transcribed into an RNA strand. So DNA, as you know, right, is that double helix where it's got the two sides and they twist. So basically what they do is they unravel the DNA, make it look more like a ladder, and then they go through and they read one side of it and create an RNA strand, which is just a one-sided DNA. So that single-stranded thing is like, um, I always like to think of it as like a Lego booklet. So when the Lego company right puts out its designs, they give you a booklet that teaches you how to do everything. That booklet is the RNA strand. The RNA leaves the nucleus and then another protein reads it. So it says, ah, this is what the RNA says. And then proteins bring the amino acids and clip them together to form the protein. Now, how does it know which one to grab? Well, RNA is sequenced in a code, which is called a codon. So each set of three bases is one codon and it signals four an amino acid. There's one codon that is called the start codon, and that's AUG, and that means a new protein starts here. There are also three stop codons, UAA, UAG, and UGA. These codons are telling um, the mechanism that we're done. We don't need to keep going anymore. The protein's complete. Each of the 20 amino acids have one or several codons that call for their use. So this long strand of RNA is just a list of the amino acids in order of attachment. So if you were reading the RNA, it would start with the start one, which is... Where did the start one go? There it is. So the start one, right, is uh, AUG. So that means we start. So we start here. And then the next one might say hmm, AAA. So that means you put a lysine there. And then GCU, that's an alanine. UCC, that's a serine. And it continues until the RNA has a stop codon. So let's say that it had at the very end, it would say UGA. And then that whole mechanism knows, ah, it's time to stop. The other cool thing about proteins is that proteins fold from a long chain of amino acids into a protein with a specific shape and function on their own. So once the chain has created, it will start to fold on its own into a specific shape that helps it do the job it's supposed to do. And it'll do this as many times as needed, and it does it pretty much instantaneously, which is really cool. 
Each protein folds due to the chemical constraints of the various amino acids that make up the chain. If we were to go back and look at all the amino acids again, all of these side chains have different chemical properties. And so if certain side chains are there, right, it can't be next to other side chains because of like the, the electrostatic forces and all that. And so that changes how it can fold. Proteins have also been shown to refold correctly every time, regardless of how they are unfolded. So it is possible to unfold proteins. It's called denaturing them. And if you denature a protein, it'll refold back into the shape it's supposed to on its own. It won't doesn't need any prompting. It'll just do it, which is really cool. And we've actually been able to see that in a very powerful microscope. So we, we, we've seen that it does work that way, which is really cool. How do we know what proteins look like? It's a great question. And we've been able to learn the structures of these proteins thanks to crystallization, which is a chemistry technique that shows us 3D structures. So here is a crystallization of a protein, and you can see the, its shape um, and how it folds in 3D. We also oftentimes uh, show proteins in these cool little squiggly line things, um, and that's just to give the general shape. Um, this is like the best picture of them, but these are like really good approximations. Proteins can also have multiple structures, up to five, which can occur based on their surroundings and their circumstances. So based on where they are, and maybe the circumstances of where they are in a cell, they might change structure to do their job slightly differently. Um, our understanding of proteins has actually given us a lot of different things that we're able to do now that we weren't able to do in the past, which has been really exciting. Um, so for instance, knowing about their structure and all about these proteins has kind of allowed scientists and doctors to expand the scope of medical treatment for a variety of diseases. So untreatable genetic disorders, cancers, things that we weren't really able to do anything about in the past, we're now able to do things because we could make proteins on our own. So for instance, insulin, right, uh, the, the thing that um, if you don't produce enough of causes diabetes, we now can create our own insulin, right? So we're creating our own protein to help these people who can't create their own insulin. So that's a treatment that's being made possible because of protein science, right? Conceivably, we can continue to apply these principles to make cures for other genetic diseases where proteins are constructed incorrectly. So there are lots of other diseases that affect people every day where proteins are not being created correctly because of maybe there is a uh, mutation in the gene or something's not being coded correctly. And so if we could, we could potentially, right, um, synthesize these proteins in a lab and then take those proteins and inject them into somebody and then those proteins could do it correctly and then that would fix the problem which is really cool. So that's something that we're, that scientists and doctors are working on, um, really advancing um, medical science, thanks to our understanding of proteins and our ability to chemically synthesize things now. So thank you guys so much for watching uh, this scientific terminology video about proteins. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We learned, we learned something. Um, as always, if there's something you wanna learn about that I haven't covered yet, go ahead and drop a comment below the video. Um, I do read the comments. I do look and see what you guys think. Um, so if there's something you want to learn about, I'll make a video about it. I always love suggestions. It helps make this process a lot easier because picking what to do can be kind of hard. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time. We have a scientific terminology video. See you soon.